Hey, everybody. It's Judy Warner again with Altium's On Track podcast. Thanks for joining us again. We have yet another amazing guest on a fascinating topic that I hope you will enjoy and learn about today. Um, But before we get started, I wanted to invite you to please connect with me on LinkedIn. I like to share a lot of content relative to designers and engineers, and I'd be happy to connect with you personally. And on Twitter, I'm at Altium Judy, and Altium uh, is on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. We also record this podcast simultaneously on video. So on the Altium's YouTube channel, you can find us under videos, and then you will see the whole series of podcasts that we record. So that is all the housekeeping we have for the moment. So let's jump right in to our topic today, which is embedded passives and I have a wonderful expert for you today and an old friend Bruce Mahler of Omega Technologies. Bruce welcome thanks so much for joining us and giving us a lesson today on embedded technology. Thank you Judy it's uh, great being on board here and uh, look forward to uh, talking to you and the audience about embedded resistors in particular as well as other embedded passives. Okay so Before we get going, I want to make sure that I'm calling this technology the right thing. Because I always think of them being embedded passives, but I don't think I'm right. How how would you characterize the technology exactly? Well, the Omega Ply product, our embedded resistive product, is ER embedded resistors, um, uh, PCT, planar component technologies, it goes by many names, um, embedded resistors, embedded capacitors. I think the most common now is ER, embedded resistors, EC, embedded capacitors in particular, when we're talking about passive elements. And those are the two main ones that are really driving uh, the embedded passive uh, world and embedded component world right now. Um, So yeah, Omega Ply is just fine with me. Okay, so let's jump in now. You told me something recently that I was kind of shocked to learn about, and I'd like you to give us a brief history of Omega Technologies and sort of the the evolution of this technology. What I was really shocked to learn is the age of the company. So can you tell us more about that? Sure. Um, many, uh, many people who are looking at using embedded passives think of it as a new technology, something just on the market. It's been out a year or two, you know, no new applications, no applications yet, but people are looking at it. So when we're asked, uh, this Omega Ply product, you know, how long have you been making it for? And I said, oh, since about 1972. (laughs) And they said, wait a second, 1972? Said, yeah, it's actually, you know, we're going on 46 years now. And uh, it's amazing that a it's probably the oldest new technology <laughs> out there. That's and a good way I, to put it. I, I think that has a lot to do with the uh, functionality of the material, how it could be used in so many different ways. And so just briefly, a history of the technology. Originally, the Omega Ply embedded resistive thin film material was developed, conceived and developed uh, by Mica Corporation. Any of your old listeners on board know mica used to be a copper clad laminator supplied epoxy glass laminates uh, and uh, polyimic glass uh, did a number of other things. And it was conceived in the early 70s as a way of adding functionality to a laminate material. So rather than just getting copper, you know, uh, foil bonded to a dielectric, it was a copper foil that had a functional purpose beyond just being copper traces bonded to a dielectric. And so after many years of development at MICA, a product Omega Ply was developed, that's Mm O-H-M-E-G-A Ply. Uh, The MICA laminate product was MICA Ply. That's how the main Omega originally came about. And it was originally developed in the early 70s as a new product. Now. With any new product, somebody had to be the first to go ahead and try it. You know, who was going to be on the bleeding edge of any new technology? Who was going to be the risk taker? 
And the interesting thing is that back in the early 70s, about, again, 72, 73, the first users of the technology were two absolutely opposite companies and absolutely opposite areas of the electronic industry. One of those happened to be Canon Electronics in Japan. Canon, making AE-1 SLR cameras at the time, looked at the technology as being a great way of making a step potentiometer that could eliminate the ceramic potentiometer circuits that they were currently using at the time, and it fit very neatly into their camera system. So it's a very simple, these were surface resistors, mm -hmm. printed electron FR4, make resistive elements uh, into potentiometers, and they started using it in their AE-1 camera. Very quickly, Nikon and Pentax started doing the same thing. Um, the other first user happened to be somebody completely opposite. Now, we're talking about the early 70s. And that user was Control Data Corporation, used to be in business a long time ago, CDC's Aerospace Group, who had some very dense multi-layer boards of mixed dielectric layers of PTFE Teflon, layers of FR4. Wow. They had ECL, Ecologic, lots and lots of termination needs, and absolutely no real estate on some of their high-speed mm -hmm. digital boards for termination. So the idea of being able to print and etch a resistive element and embed it within a circuit layer, particularly underneath an IC package, freed up board area for them, allowed them to terminate. They got some other benefit of better electricals. They started using us. And then very quickly thereafter, other divisions of CDC started using us in things like their cyber mainframe computer systems. And it kind of dovetailed into people like Cray Research and their supercomputers. And we went from there to super mini computers, you know, places like uh, digital equipment and Prime and Wang and Data General and Harris, all the guys in the 80s who had ecologic termination needs. So it was a heyday back in the 80s in a lot of mainframes, supercomputers, super mini computers, uh, kind of like with those very, very powerful systems that people now carry on in their cellular phones. <laughs> in their you know, pocket, at right? At the time, it was very, very powerful, though. Yeah. So, and so. Although two different areas of growth, we in the 70s and 80s got new applications and digital application, particularly termination, but we also started working very closely with the military aerospace industry where they saw the elimination of solder joints being a very positive thing. Mm. You know, high heat force doesn't affect it, vibration, there is no joint there. That makes just sense. Were integral to the circuits. So we started working with a lot of them in the military aerospace space-based applications, radars, antenna, power dividers, um, high-speed digital systems, uh, just a variety of different things. And it's evolved from there. It seems that every five years, new technology comes on that says, I need to use that. Right. So we can talk more about that in a okay. bit. Okay. But uh, we'll, we'll get back to maybe the basics of what do we actually do? How do we make it? Yeah. You know, what so let's talk about, it? yeah, so what... Tell us about Omega Ply. Um, what is it? What is it like to process? And let's just go in and, and okay. tell us That's the whole story. Oh man, you want to go right back to the beginning again? Okay. The, <laughs> the Omega Ply technology is a thin film resistive foil. Now, we became Omega Technologies was a spinoff of Mica, started as a separate independent company in 1983. And we basically took over that whole technology from MICA. And what that technology involves is taking copper foil. This is standard ED electrodeposited copper foil that the printed circuit industry uses. And we, through a reel-to-reel -reel deposition process, this is a plated process. Okay. We plate a very thin coating of a nickel phosphorus, NIP resistive alloy, onto the mat or tooth side of that copper. And by varying the thickness of that resistive coating, we can vary the sheet resistivity. And so this product, a true thin film, nickel phosphorus alloy, we're talking about fractions of a micron thick film. So it's truly thin film. So we have a variety of different sheet resistivities. 
A 10 ohm per square is about a one micron thick film. A 25 ohm per square is a 0.4 micron, 50 ohm is 0.2 micron. So it's very linear. Um, as the film that we deposit gets thinner, the sheet resistivity goes up. Now we start getting into the dangerous territory of talking about things like ohms per square, and I don't want to start having your your listeners, our eyes crack, <laughs> get into some strange areas. But suffice it to say, it follows thin film technology. Okay. You know, what we do is we make a resistive foil that's a re that copper foil resistive coating. Now what that foil does, that's what we make at our facilities in our factory in Culver City, California, mm -hmm. very close to LAX or a few miles away. We've been doing it now, you know, for literally 40 years plus at that facility. That resistive foil then gets laminated or bonded to a variety of dielectrics. Um, we work with people like Rogers, Arlon, Taconic. We work with Isola. We work with Nolco. Uh, we do some work with DuPont. We're working with others out there. But essentially, the resistive foil can be bonded to almost any kind of dielectric, just like any other copper foil. Standard uh, pressing, heat pressure, it bonds to a variety of dielectrics. Now that laminate product, that copper clad laminate with the resistive film between the copper and the substrate goes to the printed circuit board community. The PCB community then prints an etched copper circuitry. They normally will do a print develop etch strip process to create copper circuits. Mm -hmm. Now they go through a separate, an additional print develop etch strip, so it's a two print operation. Okay. First print is defining where they have copper traces. Then they etch away all excess copper, and they etch away all excess resistive film underneath that copper. Now they have copper circuitry. Underneath all that copper circuitry is a resistive material, but electrically it's shorted out by the copper above it. Mm -hmm. All you have is copper traces. Makes sense. At that point, think of it as a treatment of copper only, like a zinc or a brass. Okay. Now the board shops come back and they apply more photoresist over that copper circuitry, and they print a second piece of artwork. And that artwork def you know, protects all the area that they wish to keep as copper and exposes for etching the copper that will be the resistive element. Now, in, in almost all cases, the first etch will define the width of that copper that will be the width of that resistive element. So the second image artwork defines a length of copper that will be the length of the resistor. So it's a very simple piece of artwork to use, very easy to register. But after protecting the, the copper with photoresist, now they etch away the exposed copper using alkaline-based etchants, and they leave behind the resistive film that was underneath it, and they have a resistive element. Interesting. Stripping the photoresist off the board leaves them with copper circuitry with resistive elements that are integral to that copper plane. Those resistors can be tested for value. They can go through standard multi-layer processing, you know, laid up with other cores, pressed, and then forget you have the resistive elements embedded. It goes through traditional uh, drilling, print, develop that strip process or, uh, or plate process, I should say. Uh, so you do a drilling and you de-smear, you plate your etch, and your embedded resistor inside, and as a bare board now, prior to shipment for assembly, the board shop can do traditional testing, and they can measure resistor values to assure they're within inspect. They could also be used on the surface of a board, in which case you solder mask over the resistive elements along with your, your copper traces, and that protects them from abrasion and scratching. Mm -hmm. The key here is this, though. If you use a discrete resistive element, an 0402, an 0201. Mm -hmm. An 0201 is a 10 mil by 20 mil resistor. They're pretty small. Yeah. Hard to handle, they're hard to assemble. So if I go to a board shop now and say, hey guys, I want you to etch a copper trace that's 10 mils wide. Cinchy. They're gonna look and they'll laugh, they'll say, come on, you're, you're insulting us. Yeah. We do five and five, four and four, three mm -hmm. and three, two and two technology. So, you know, Etching a 10 mil trace isn't a big deal. Five mil trace is not a big deal. When they etch that copper trace, they're essentially defining the width of the resistor. So it's like a, com a controlled impedance trace. They're creating a resistive element of a certain width. Now you say, can you cover with photoresist and, and have a little box window that's 20 mils long? 
Sure, that's not a big deal. You etch the copper away, sure. Now they've left themselves with a 10 mil by 20 mil resistive element, which does not push the yard at all. It's already built in, no assembly and all that. So if you say, hey, can they do a five mil by 10 mil resistor? Sure. We have applications that are using 50 micron by 100 micron resistors. If a board shop can etch top or trace, that's the limit of the resistor width you can create. So you can get a significantly small, very, 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 very precise resistors that could be located right where you want them under a package. And that's what we're doing a lot of newer applications like microfluidic heaters that are, you know, you're talking about a couple mils, you know, by uh, four or five mils, you can get very small heat rises in a very localized area, very low power. But I'm ahead of myself. So. Yeah, right. well, okay, so, so I'm thinking about our audience right now who are uh -huh. probably EEs that are doing design or just um, purist board designers for the most part. Right. Why? Right. Why would I want to use Omega Ply over traditional? I mean, you just mentioned one. If I didn't want to, if I had space restrictions and I didn't want to use these tiny, tiny parts, that seems like a no-brainer, but is it? Is it real estate? Is it cost? Like what drives people? I think I'm opening a can of worms, so sorry. But what <laughs> is the cost, performance, reliability implications? And if I was a designer, why would I want to use a Megaply? Okay, it's a good question. And, and you know, people use it for a variety of reasons. The best reason we like to hear is, I have a design and there's no other way I can design this thing unless I get rid of my resistors. And so kind of I get a tear, you know, I well up a little <laughs> bit. I get very emotional with those yeah. because, you know, then it's all driven by performance and densification. Right. But look at everybody, but, but, but realistically, cost is a big driver as is performance. And obviously densification all goes hand in hand and reliability. I would say most designers design us for, for a number of reasons. The key reason that we focus on is densification. And that is this. If I have a certain number of resistors on a board, and I said, you know, I'm having a hard time routing, I have a lot of passes on my board, my board, either I have to route in more layers, so I'm adding to a multi-layer design, mm. or maybe it's traditional through hole, and I'm gonna have to go to HDI, which adds a lot of cost to my board, right. or maybe my form factor, my X and Y dimension is a little too big, I need to shrink it down, or my board's a little too thick, I gotta make it a little thinner, so here's a, a, a tool, a technology that allows you to do that. So let's say I have one resistor in a unit area of a board. And somebody says, well, gee, I want to etch and print natural resistor. But okay, it's gonna, what's cost going to be? It's going to cost whatever our materials, you know, divided by one. It's going to be one resistor. Now, instead, I have 10 resistors. What's the cost? It's our unit cost divided by 10 because it's the same material. Mm. It goes through the same print etch process. So the greater the number of the resistors, the lower the cost per unit resistor. One application f that uses our technology, and this is where it reinvents itself. A number of years ago, five, six years ago, it started being used in men's microphone. If any of your mm. listeners out there, any of your designers have a cell phone, yeah. you very likely have us in your cell phone, in the men's microphone that you're talking out of or you're listening out of right now. Now, why use us in a, in, a, in a MEMS microphone? We're part of an RC filter network which improves the sound fidelity significantly. So it's been found to be a very significant um, offering by the MEMS microphone makers and their end customers who are the cell phone manufacturers. Mm. It's been in very mass, mass quantity production for many, many years over in the Far East, particularly in China, where you know our product is used extensively. Mm -hmm. So in those applications, it was a combination of densification. They can make their, their these MEMS microphone boards, the PCBs, thinner, because they eliminate the chip resistor. They don't have to assemble it. They can make them a little bit smaller. And because you're talking about such small, small little elements, even a few resistors, only a couple resistors in that design, the, you're talking about a fraction of a, a cent to put these resistive elements in a board. Fraction of a cent, no assembly. Uh, yeah, when they're in the millions, that's, that's that matters. Product, all yeah. that's very important. Yeah. Here's another example. If I'm a designer and say, hey, I have a high density IO IC. Mm -hmm. my, my fast rise times, I have some termination issues. 
but I'm on a 300 uh, uh, micron pad pitch and there's no way I can put a discrete component on my surface to go ahead and terminate. I have too far to go. I have too many of these lines. Mm. So I have an IO of hundreds of traces, maybe a thousand traces. How yeah. can I do it? But guess what? If you're able to take every trace, every logic trace coming off that, that IO, and I build a resistor as part of that trace, to have a trace that has mm. just a little of the copper removed, leaving a resistive element behind. So it's a resistor built in trace, which is one of our products, Orbit, Omega resistors built in trace. That's cool. You can terminate every one of those drive lines. They're underneath the IC package, so they take up no board area. They terminate off that, uh, that drive line. You improve impedance matching, reduce line delay. You also save money because now you literally have hundreds of resistors in a square inch of area or a couple square inches of area, and it saves a lot of cost mm -hmm. by not having to assemble and put those discretes on your board. Now, so cost is a big driver. I just mentioned a couple of them. Densification is as well. But our material also is essentially inductive free. So, you know, it means that you have less inductive reactants with fast rise times. So what happens, you get less EMI coming off your board. Mm. It's a cleaner signal. Our materials also, because of that, used in certain applications for ab absorbers or our cards where they use us, that resistive film, to suppress some of the EMI coming off board. Interesting. That's building agent. So there's another application. So we're used extensively not just in power dividers and R cards and, and absorbers, but obviously as terminators, as in filters, pull up, pull down resistors. And now we're seeing a lot of activity in, in heater elements. So uh, we're in the military aerospace uses a SAL, semi-active laser activation, where they have tiny resistive elements on PCBs that can go ahead and activate a laser for laser guidance for smart mm. munition, missile systems, you know, or you know, heater elements that can go ahead and maintain heat on critical components and avionics or even in space-based applications where our product is used in satellites and even in deep space probes. We were on a Mars Express Beagle 2 lander on the surface of Mars where we have an Omega heater keep critical components up to above minus 50 C. Uh, it would have worked great if uh, the parachute did not land on top of the lander and <laughs> prevent the deployment of a solar array. But hey, it was a great application for our product. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, again, I think just such a surprise, or at least it was to me when I learned about, one, how old the technology is, and two, that it's really because of complexity and just all the different things that are going on in the industry right now that it's growing. It's growing at a quick significantly so we've, yeah. we've had some wonderfully record year every year is a record year uh but that's the nice thing the, the resistive film is like a blank slate what you do with it is up mm. to you as a designer and so yeah in the 80s it was all ecologic termination and then it goes into power dividers and they're still doing all that stuff mm -hmm. but you know what's happening now is we're seeing you know it, it utilized in so many different ways so we talk about the MEMS microphone. Well, there's new sensor technology. There's there's accelerometers or other there's other MEMS type sensors that use us. Now we see automotive sensor technology that says, hey, we could use this not only is it obviously super high reliability, been out for decades, you know, can be done in right. high volumes, very cost effective, de density impacts densification, but there's some critical components that could use us some automotive. 5G technology, you know. You're what about the IoT, Bruce? It seems like ideal for IoT, provided the cost well, is. Well, in IoT, you're saying? Yes. The Internet of Things. Well, that's what I'm talking about. Sensor technology. Okay, so it's, those are the a kinds lot of, of areas. everything, right? It, IoT is a combination of a lot of things. You're yes. About technologies are getting into it. We see our stuff on flexible materials and wearables. You know, oh, wearables. Yeah, that was the other on, thing I was wondering devices about. Devices and wearable devices. You know, we can get smaller. Uh, home devices, home audio devices, you know, uh, and as things get thinner, smaller, everybody wants things densified. Yep. So getting rid of the passives especially really allows you to do that. So, you know, yeah, IoT is a big thing, automotive, even memory devices going to DDR4, going out to DDR5. Those fast data rates are causing needs for termination again, and JEDEC has approved the 
Im embedded resistor within some of the DDR4 structures. So memory is another area. So between you know sensor technologies and automotive and home devices, in things like uh, uh, memory devices, in things like heater, microfluidic heater, bio uh biomedical type things you know we have micro heaters on an embedded board that you can have uh, fluid come in and uh, and have basically a breakdown of the protein to do analysis you know and they use us for things like that it's pretty exciting so yeah it's been around for 45 years but guess what we think that the new technologies the new applications it's almost like just starting over again yeah so, i can yeah, see that we, especially we, we have the we have the reliability, long-term use, you know, high volume, low volume, high, you know, high density, low density, so many different ways of doing it. So that's nice to have that background and make people feel good about right. using a technology. But knowing that all these new things are developing, I mean, I can't wait for the next 45 years. You know? <laughs> that's fun. <laughs> well, um, a couple of things I wanted to ask you about what made me uh, think of calling you and, and wanting to do this sort of a side note is you know you hear about passives being on allocation and all of that and I'm like I wonder if Bruce is seeing an uptick just because people are freaking out over automotive buying up whole lines of that oh, yeah. I, I don't know if you're seeing that it was just a curiosity I had but well yeah I, I, I know what you're saying we, we definitely see an uptick okay. now now, part of that uptick within the context of the of the industry, you know, first off, you know, um, I do want to tell your audience, especially okay. your designers, we've been doing this for 40, 45 years plus, as I mentioned, you know, 46 years. Um, I'd like to say that I was only two years old when I first got introduced to technology. But we're, going, we're going with that. Not, I, I, not I was true. I was three, you were two. Let's go that. with that. I'm not going but, to. But, but we, we also have designers at our company whose job it is to work with the design community, particularly a PCB designer, who can help them optimize their design, who can develop real, uh, you know, footprints of, of resistors. What we don't want your, your listeners to do is reinvent the wheel. We want you to use our knowledge, talk to our people, say, hey, here's what I think I'd like to do. I'd I have an application, I wanna use this. Does it make sense for your technology? If it doesn't, we don't want you wasting your time. It's ultimately you're going to say we're not going to use it anyway. We want you to have an optimized design because we want you to be successful. Mm -hmm. So think of us as an extension of your of, of your team. We're part of your design team. We're there to help and assist. If you go to our website, you know ohmega.com, there's a lot of white papers. There's a lot of good information there that people can read and reference. But more importantly, is the communication with our staff, technical people who can really help you. Now, talking about in general the industry, there is an uptick in that. Um, we talk about passives, you know, I mentioned that we're in filters and MEMS microphone, resistors and capacitors. And in one case, uh, one of the capacitive material, the embedded capacitor material, ferret collects, which is a embedded capacitor material, it's produced by Oak Mitsui. Mm -hmm. So Omega Technologies, my company, and Oak Mitsui got together and combined the material and uh, had our resistive material on their capacitive material so we'd have one layer what? of resistor capacitor. What? How what? did they my do that? My head just exploded. Well, what we did was we found that it was it's pretty simple from a technology standpoint. It's stick to two technologies. Each separately have its own complexities. But working together, it, it really amazing. worked out very well. Importantly enough, it had such synergistic effects in terms of improved power, lower RTC characteristics, or change of resistance to function of temperature down almost nothing. It was the stability That's is crazy. astounding over wide temperature ranges that we applied and we got a jointly held patent for the combined technology, which we have US and also all over the world now. So it's a joint technology patent between Omega Technologies and between Oak Mitsui and Mitsui Mining in Japan for this technology. And we see applications where if somebody wants to get a resistor and embed it, they also want to embed capacitor. Yeah. But if they want to get rid of uh, capacitors that are passive, a lot of times they want to get rid of resistors too. So it goes hat in, hat in hand with it, a lot of those. It does, it does, in it general, makes sense. 
in general, there is a lot of movement in the industry to embed it, um, but it's a growing thing uh, because of densification, growing needs for real estate, smaller, thinner, lighter. Uh, you touched upon something, and that is material sources. You know, right now, you know, the industry is going through some uptick. I think part of that's military aerospace mm -hmm. the, that has increased uh, amount of funding and a lot of uh, military programs. Yay for that. Mm -hmm. but, but in also other areas. So we've seen that as well. And our, our product is using a lot of stuff. Acer radar system, F-35, F-22, a lot of missile systems, you know, the Eurofighter, you know, just all over the place. A lot of satellites, a lot of uh, SATCOM, a lot of other things like that. A lot of radars on the ground as well. But we also were seeing that uptick because the IoT, as you mentioned, you know, the Internet of Things, there's more and more sensor technologies being being demanded into a lot of different products. People are amazed at how many sensors go into so many things these days. Yeah. And, and the key with a lot of that is, you know, densification, smaller, faster, cheaper. So that gets hand in hand with the 5G, the automotive, you know, uh, self-driving cars that are coming up, a lot of the sensors, the LiDAR, other sensor technologies that go into self-driving automobiles. And what everybody says is, hey, that all sounds great, but you know what? If I have a printed circuit board and I use it in a computer and I have a failure in that, you know, it's okay. So it's annoying, my computer goes out, I swap a board, I put a new component, but I cannot afford to have any failure, I cannot afford to have right. anything go wrong if I'm in an automobile that's driving itself. There's right. absolutely yeah. zero room for you know, any kind of failure. And so it's taken very seriously in the industry and going to a lot of these conferences and hearing the talks, the people involved uh, you know, with um, uh, testing a lot of these are, are very concerned. They have to have absolute, as, as tough as it was, they have to make it even tougher for testing. Yeah. Nothing can fail. So a lot of that comes into what can we do to improve reliability? Hey, let's get rid of solder joints. Yeah. Right. What thing the thing doesn't cause something to go ding and fly off a board anymore. Right. Or, you know, X and Y expansion or mm -hmm. Z axis expansion. All those things. Get rid of those solder joints, mechanical joints, improve the reliability while you enhance densify in, in, in improved electrical performance. So we're seeing that that's going on right now. And the other thing is that, you know, companies are concerned. You know, the industry is facing some interesting things right now. And the printed circuit industry, copper lead times are really yeah, out there. That's crazy uh, too. You know, like, the industry is getting smaller and smaller, yet at the same time, the end users and designers have to rely more and more on, uh, on fewer and fewer resources. It's true. So we've been around since, like I said, 1972. Okay, so for 46 years, we've been supplying this technology. And we have never, ever not been able to supply this in those 46 years. It's important for us that, A, we manufacture everything ourselves. Mm -hmm. We make that resistive film. We test it. We have test facilities to make sure that the product is what it should be before it chips out the door. We have hands-on manufacturing that's critical. We don't want to subcontract making our product because we feel it's too important to our customers. They're relying on us. If we subcontracted, what would happen if whoever we had make it went out of business? Yeah. Or they sold the business, I don't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And then we can't get product, our customers can't. We don't want to rely on someone else. That's mm -hmm. number one. Number two, we have very good, close working relationships with our raw material supplier. Most of our raw materials are USA based. We get them in from the US. You know, we want to have a, a, a critical supply chain. You know, when you're when you're talking about scarce resources like copper and other yeah. things, it's important that you have that. We have that kind of relationship with our suppliers so that we always have product. We're always there to support our customer needs when they need it, how they need it. And that to me is very, very important. Because a lot of companies are coming to us saying, oh my God, you know, we, we're giving two, two months lead time on getting product and how are we supposed to deal with that? And they said, what about you guys? I said, you want some of our stuff? We'll ship it tomorrow to Right. It, it, to us, that's very important. Customer 
you got to go ahead and satisfy customer needs and especially their concerns. That's absolutely yeah. critical in this industry today. Yeah, and it's refreshing because, you know, we get in this weird cultural thing as a business and it's like, oh, faster, cheaper, or we're going to be the lean supply chain and buy out. We, we get into this whole frenetic thing, but we forget if we're not meeting the needs of the customer, we'll be out of business. So I really love that philosophy. Now, as far as our listeners go, Bruce, um, we're going to share all of this on in the show notes, right? Everything that's on your website, I encourage you. Put it Okay, so we're going to supply all those links and um, the website. You guys, if you're interested, you can call Omega Technologies directly, get the help that Bruce alluded to. But they have a really great website with some really neat things that can will go into even more depth than Bruce has gone into so far. So thank you so much. So. Bruce, as we wrap up here, first of all, thank you. Bruce is joining us from IMS in Philadelphia today, even though he's his Omega's in Culver. So thank you for hopping out of the show for a few minutes to give our listeners a treat. So thank you for that. Um, When I wrap up the podcast, I always like to to have a little feature in here called Designers After Hours because most of us techie weirdos have a little bit of a right brain and have interesting hobbies I've found. Is there anything that you do after hours that is creative, compelling, interesting, or otherwise? Or do you have any after hours? Do you just work uh, all the time, Bruce? Do I have any after hours? That's the good question. That's a good question. Uh, uh, yeah, we encourage people to call us and that keeps me rather active and the, and the staff at Omega. And we welcome that. Please, please, please call us, email us. We'd love to talk to you and listen to you. As, as to me, yeah, I enjoy travel. I enjoy writing. Uh, you know, I always have. Um, you know, now it's mostly technical things or papers that I publish. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I love doing uh, uh, fiction as well. I do do that, and I get very involved. Uh, between that and having a lot of crazy grandchildren running underfoot, no, that's uh, that keeps me going pretty that much. That fills up your plate. <laughs> So, yeah. um, also, would you say you are a geek or a nerd? I'm sorry? Would you say you are a geek or a nerd? Um, hmm, that's a good question. I'm probably more geek than nerd. Yeah. You know, they, they've cleaned me up over the years, so I'm not too <laughs> neat. I think I'm more geeky. So. <laughs> yeah, I would say you're more geeky, but you are walking on the razor's edge, my friend. You can oh, you can tip into that nerd space. Oh man, pretty easily. I'm so good. I've been so good. <laughs> I haven't cracked any jokes that you usually moan about. Okay? I've been so good. I kept Ooh. the propeller off my head. None of this stuff. No, be fruitful and multiply. Yeah, none of that. No, I've been really good. You know, so. Here I am. Now I'm now you're telling me I'm I'm close to No, a- no, only in the best <laughs> kind of way that you like go into this nerdy space of technology, but Well, that's, but it's that's a, really You want to know something? It's been a long time. I've been doing this a long time. Yeah. And and I I'm, I'm so excited. Yeah. By, you know, it's like it's it's a renewal. If people get that I'm excited about technology about where Omega fits into technology, yeah, it's because I really am. It's genuine. Our president, Alan Levy, uh, you know, of Omega Technology, you know, here's a guy who's who's had the same kind of passion. So every time we see something, we're always sending articles. To, Look at this! Isn't this neat? Isn't it? So if you call that nerdy, you call that uh, geeky. That's fine. You know what? We we call it being uh, being uh, enthused with technology and how we fit into that technology. Absolutely. And now, because I've been called a nerd and a geek, I'm going to drown myself in a Philly steak sandwich here. So <laughs> see what you've done With to me. <laughs> extra cheese and onions. No, I when I say here, you, you teeter, is only because I remember when I was working at Translating Technology, you came in and you were showing us how it's done, how it's processed as a board shop, and I remember listening to you going, 
this guy totally knows his stuff and it was so articulate and I'm like boy when I grow up I want to be able to talk like this like Bruce Mahler does man he's got it going on so that's why well, I say until I grow up you'll really see that <laughs> <laughs> well it is an exciting time in technology there's no grass growing under our feet so I share your enthusiasm for everything that's coming up in the market and you're seeing everything so that is really exciting well thank it's you again for Thank you. I, I appreciate, Judy, the, the opportunity to spend time with you and spend time with your audience. And hi to everyone out there. Look forward <laughs> to talking with you. Look forward to working with you. And uh, like I said, a lot of exciting things out there right now in our industry. So uh, we're, we're working in the, the best industry out there. We are. That's now we're going to send poor Bruce back to booth duty where he no. can <laughs> stand can in the that. booth. And so sorry <laughs> to send you back to booth, but thank you so much. Again, this has been Judy Warner with Altium's On Track Podcast and Bruce Mahler of Omega Technologies. Thanks for tuning in again. Um, until we hear or talk to you next time, always remember to stay on track.